Okay, moment of truth. Will this engine run? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is the day that I know many of you have been waiting for. I sure have. We're going to see my PM Research steam engine run for real for the very first time. We just have one more part to make, the connecting rod, and then we're going to put it all together, and this engine is going to make some noise. It's going to be amazing. Stay tuned. Let's go. Here's the casting straight from the kit. It's got quite a large sprue on one end there and quite a lot of parting lines there, but uh, otherwise it's quite a cool casting. So I'm going to start by filing off the large sprue on the end and trying to match the curve there on the end as best I can. That's looking a little more like it should. It's a shame that sprue wasn't bigger. I would have kept it for fixturing, but sadly no dice there. So now some more detailed filing on the smaller seams. First order of business is to get the bolts installed on the sides of the connecting rod big end there. This is very similar to the eccentric strap that we did before. So this is the setup I'm trying. I got some shims packed underneath the rod there and one on top to protect it. Then I'm clamping it to a one, two, three block and squaring it up using the straight sides of the bosses there, which are kind of the only straight things on the whole casting. And that seems okay. It's not super rigid, this setup, but we'll see if we can get away with it. So then I'm bluing up and marking the center lines of the bosses there. Just like the eccentric strap, we have to drill and tap the bolts here and then install the bolts. And then we can do the rest of the operations and the bolts will hold the two halves in alignment here as we go. The drawing does specify the distance between the bolts. So I'm just double checking that we're in range there and that looks good. It doesn't really matter that distance, but it is specified. So we'll try and hit it. And I'm gonna line up my center drill there just by eye with a little hand twist and some magnification. This is my favorite trick for centering on a rough casting when precision is not super critical. It seems to work very well. And then I'm also double checking with the clearance drill that we're gonna be using and just making sure that it lines up in the correct place visually on the casting here. And that is a good indicator that we're in the right spot. So time to center drill. And then we drill all the way through with the tapping drill size for the bolts. And then I need to clearance drill the top half of each boss, which I do by setting a zero on the quill DRO at the top and then drilling to a specific depth. And now we can come in and tap the bottom halves of those holes. And when this is all said and done, we'll be left with a clamping system on both sides of the boss here because the top half is clearance drilled, the bottom half is tapped, and we're gonna be splitting it in half. A little test fit with the bolt here and it threads in, but as expected, it interferes with the curvature of the casting there. So the drawing calls for a spot face here, which I'm gonna do with a little end mill. And I just did this by trial and error. I just moved in a bit by bit with the end mill. I got the mirror there so I can see what I'm doing. I just test fit it until the bolt head sat firmly down on the machine surface there. That's looking pretty good. And did the same thing on the other side. That's the easy part done. Now comes the exciting stuff. So I'm gonna clamp it again on my one, two, three block fixture here, but this time with the head sticking up above because now it's time to come in with the slitting saw and cut this thing in half. So I'm using a feeler to find the top of one boss and the same feeler to find the bottom. And then I use the half function on the Z on the DRO to find the center line of the casting here. And we are going to split this thing right in half. This should be pretty exciting. Now I was worried that this setup isn't really rigid enough for the slitting saw here because it's a thin casting there holding this boss up in the air like this. And, and yeah, I was getting a lot of vibration on that. So I came in again and I added some sacrificial packing blocks and a tool maker's clamp that should just barely clear the slitting saw. And this was much better. There was no vibration on that now and the saw was cutting really well. So just took my time here and made my way through the casting here. When I got close to the center, I had to move over to the side of the saw. I like to cut right on the center line of the saw if I can. It makes better chips that way, but this is still working. However, I got to this point here and there was just a little bit of interference between the toolmaker's clamp and the arbor on the saw. I wasn't quite gonna make it, so I took that off and then I just came back from the other side where it's a lighter cut and finished it off. So that was a pretty exciting operation, but it seemed to go really well. The two halves of the casting there look really good. I got nice finishes on both. From this point on, we're gonna rely on the bolts to keep those two halves in alignment. It would be nice if there was keys on these parts, but there aren't. So I'm gonna punch them as well to make sure that I keep everything the same orientation from now on. 
Next I need to remove material from both halves of the clamp to make the casting round in this area. They give you extra thickness so that you can have however much saw curve you need. So I'm marking the center of the casting left to right and then using the split line as the center on the other axis and I'm center punching that and then I'm just going to scribe the final circle size that will eventually be on this clamp here. This is the bore that we're going to put in that eventually. And then I can measure the distance to the edge of the casting in both of these dimensions and see how much error there is on the long axis. And that'll tell me how much I need to remove from each side of the clamp in that direction. The top half is easy because this piece is relatively easy to fixture. I'm just using a square to line up the machined surface there with the edge of the vise and get it parallel to the cut here. Ideally this surface would be perfectly square to the bolt holes on either side, but that's down to how well I fixtured that rough casting when I did that slitting saw operation. And that's pretty hard to get right, but luckily this doesn't have to be perfect because there's plenty of clearance in those holes. That went well. The finish on that came out really nice. This bronze machines really easily. I really like it. The other half is a little trickier because of the, once again, somewhat janky fixturing here. That skinny little shank there on the casting is doing a lot of work here. And you know, The first pass went okay, but even with light cuts I was getting more vibration than I was happy with. So I threw an additional toolmaker's clamp on there and that seemed to be good enough to get the job done. That was definitely a little sketchy, but it worked. So now I can deburr the holes and put the bolts back in. And anytime I reinstall the bolts like this, I put the surface down on one, two, three block to make sure that the sides of the casting are perfectly aligned. Because again, there is a fair amount of clearance in those bolt holes. And that's looking good. The bolts ended up flush with the bottom of the casting. So that's a good sign that things are going relatively well. Okay, but now it's time to get serious. The most important thing on this part is that the two bores are parallel. And then the second most important thing is that the sides of each clamp are faced square to those bores. So to do that, my janky old fixtures are not going to cut it this time. So I was trying to come up with something better and this may not be the easiest thing, but it's what occurred to me. So I put some layout die on a scrap of aluminum that's going to be a sacrificial fixture block. And then I literally traced the part on that block and I squared up a couple of lines for areas that I knew needed to be square. So those would kind of be my rough references. And then I basically just machined out the area between the lines. And I did test fits as I went along. I started with the big end of the rod there. It's kind of the best thing I have for a reference. I machined it out somewhat by measuring and somewhat by trial and error. And I kept going until I had kind of a snug fit down the entire length of the part. Now the tapered areas were just done in steps. It wasn't necessary to actually make tapered cuts here. The other key detail is that the depth of this fixture varies down its length to account for the different thicknesses in the areas of the casting so that the casting is all held parallel to its theoretical center line there. And when all was said and done, I had a nice slip fit there. It was kind of a snug press into the fixture there, which is what I wanted. And then I also drilled and tapped some holes in the top that I could use as clamping from above just to make sure that nothing moves there. So I have some copper on there to act as kind of like mini strap clamps. Now this fixture is a little bit overkill, but the part is going to stay here now for almost all of the rest of the operation. So everything will be machined in one setup. So everything that needs to be parallel and square should be so. To locate the big end bore, I'm once again marking it up here with some Sharpie and I'm finding the aesthetic center of the casting there and I'm going to center punch this right on the split line there. The main thing is that the bore be centered on the split line. So that took a couple of tries. I inspected each punch there with the magnifying glass and I moved it as needed and those bolts keep wanting to loosen on me so I retightened those and everything looks good here so time to center drill that. And now I can drill my pilot hole for the bore, so things are getting serious now. I'm drilling extra deep here into the aluminum fixture to make sure I'm going to have room for the reamer when we're done.
Now my plan was to ream this hole, so I drilled one size below the reamer, and that seemed to go okay, except, uh-oh, we've got trouble. That hole is no longer on center. It looks like what happened is the drilling caused one or both bolts to loosen on the strap here, and then that caused the drill to wander off center. So what I need to do is move this hole. So can I come in here with the reamer and just move the table over a little bit? No, definitely not. The reamer is just going to follow the hole that's there and I'm still going to end up off center. You can't move a hole with a drill or a reamer. They're too flexible. We could plunge with an end mill, but that would make the hole oversize. What we really need here is a single point cutter. What's a single point tool for making holes on a mill? The boring head. So with the boring head, I can move this hole. Now luckily we have just enough material left here. I've got about 30 thou all the way around to remove yet, and the hole is about 20 thou off center, so that's just enough material to where I can get this done. So my first cut is the same size as the existing hole, just shifted over 20 thou. And now the split line is on center again, just as it should be. However, if I now measure the hole, you can see on the long axis, I've got just short of 50 thou there on the small scale. And then on the other axis, we've got 30 thou. So as expected, the hole is 20 thou wider in one axis than the other. And now we can start widening out the hole to the final dimension. The first couple passes won't be cutting on the right because we're turning an oval into a hole now. And then as we get larger and larger, more and more of the hole will be cutting all the way around until we're done. And I'm using this end mill as a go no-go gauge because I don't have a gauge pin the, the correct size. But one last finishing cut here and we should be good. The hole is back on center. Let's clean it up here and test fit with the end mill. Now this end mill is a little bit undersized, so it is a little bit loose here. But I think we've got it. I think I feel good about that. That was a close one, but I think we rescued this part. It wouldn't have been the end of the world if I couldn't successfully move that hole back where it's supposed to be. The connecting rod would have been a little bit longer effectively than it's supposed to be mechanically, but there's plenty of adjustment in the crosshead, so probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But I'm glad we could save it. Next we need to machine the face of that bore. This is going to form one side of the big end, which is going to be riding in the crankshaft, so that needs to be very square to the bore. And with that at the proper thickness, it's down to the other end. And I'm going to mark roughly where the center of the little end bore should be. And I'm going to center punch that. And that's just going to be a guideline. I'm going to use the DRO because the drawing specifies the distance between these bores. So I move down to that position. And you can see that on the X we're good. But on the Y I need to move up a little bit. And that's because this casting is not particularly parallel to the vise right now. I kind of arbitrarily placed it on my fixture there. So that was a little bit of a miscalculation on my part. So I just moved it down to my mark on the Y axis. And this does mean that there will be a little bit of cosine error here because I moved the correct distance on the X and then down a little on the Y, but it's not going to be enough to hurt anything though. So this was a straightforward center drill, drill and ream operation. And we've got the little bore. And I need to face the sides just like on the other side. But in this case, I need to go a little bit below where the top level of the fixture is. But that's okay. This is a sacrificial fixture. One of the reasons I made it out of aluminum. So it's easy to just mill my way down right through the fixture until I get to the correct thickness on the casting. And then a little deburr on both those bores. And we are done with this position on the casting. So now we just have one last thing to do. And that's to face the other sides of these two bores. My original plan was to reuse this fixture and just flip the part over, but it was going to be a lot of work to adjust all the depths inside there for the new positions of the faces. So I decided to go back to my janky 123 block, but instead of this stack of crappy copper shims, I instead used a gauge block to get the exact spacing between the machined surface and the casting there. And this worked much better so I could ensure that the machined sides of the straps here are parallel to each other. That's the main goal here. We do have a fair amount of wiggle room here because the crankshaft has a 5 thou clearance on it and the crosshead has a 10 thou clearance. So parallelism here can be a little sloppy on these. A quick deburr and now we need to set up to split the other end. Now the big end is a strap but the little end is actually a clamp. I've been abusing that word clamp previously but this is actually a clamp. So we do the same operations as we did before on the boss for the bolt. But note that there's only a bolt on one side. And so now we're going to split that boss and then this thing is going to be a clamp that clamps on the pin that goes in the crosshead. So this thing actually retains the crosshead pin in place by clamping on it. It's actually quite a clever design that I like quite a bit. 
Now there wasn't space on this setup to do my Z half trick with the uh, slitting saw to get the center line of the boss like I did before. So this time I literally just eyeballed it on the boss. I didn't want to move the casting further up because I'd lose all of my rigidity here. It's already a little sketchy. So that worked just fine though because it's a pretty thick saw and I just have to make sure that the saw goes through the place where the counter bore clearance hole becomes the threaded hole and it'll work as a clamp. This cut went very well. The setup seemed sufficiently rigid. So here's the part so far. It's looking pretty good. Okay, let's do a test fit on the crankshaft. And hey, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Why is the crankshaft in the lathe in the fixture that I had made to make that crankshaft? Well, trouble afoot. See that little line right there? I thought that was a tool mark. And I thought the crankshaft was done. Turns out it isn't. That's actually a lip. So I did not manage to face the inside of these crank webs perfectly flat. And I had measured the inside dimension of them and it was correct, but I didn't measure all the way down at the shaft where the strap is actually going to sit. So luckily I was able to set up this fixture again because I had saved it just in case. And it was a pretty straightforward thing to use the tool that I had already ground for this purpose. And I went in there and very carefully machined that inside surface there nice and flat. Obviously before doing this I considered just facing down the connecting rod a little further but it was quite a bit of a mismatch. I needed about 10 thou in there and I didn't want the entire crank web to be kind of a sloppy fit just because that one little section at the base there needed to be excessively narrow so I just didn't feel good about doing it that way. I figured going back in and correcting the crankshaft was the right thing to do. And then the strap was a great fit. Big end went on there nicely and you can see that it moves very freely. So mission accomplished there. I'm not gonna lie, it was a little scary to put my hard earned crankshaft back under the knife, but that operation was actually very smooth because I already had all the parts and I had the experience of having done it before. We have one last little bit of plumbing to do on this connecting rod. There's an internal oil passage that goes from a lubricating cup that sits on the outside and goes down in an L shape into the bearing area. So. I'm going to start by machining that boss flat. I locate this hole on the center line on the y-axis and then for the x we have a dimension from the drawing. There's a distance specified from the edge of the bearing cap there. And then we drill straight down. And to get the depth of thread just right I scribed a little line on these taps here that I'm going to use. And then for the other half of the plumbing I need to set the rod up vertically. So I've got it clamped with some copper there. And I'm going to do my best to square it up here. This doesn't have to be perfect because we just have to meet that other passage. And the other passage has a fair generous target area on it. Now I'm going to center it up using the machined sides. So that's easy enough. For the x-axis I'm edge finding on the curvature. And that's fine as long as you don't change the height of the edge finder between readings. You'll find the same point on the curvature on both sides and it will be a valid center. Then I drill straight down till I meet the other pipe and you'll know if you did it right because you'll feel the drill break through into the other passage forming an L. And if I did it right I should be able to blow out the entire channel. And that was beautiful. Let's look at that again in slow-mo. Look at that little fountain of crud that came out of the oil passage. Love it. And it's really important to deburr this because it's actually inside a bearing surface here so we can't have any kind of burrs in there. Now we can do some assembly. So big end of the connecting rod goes on the crankshaft, which we know will fit because we tested it on the lathe earlier in festive fashion. And then the little end goes on the crosshead. The pin goes through the middle there and just center up the pin between the two parts and then tighten up the little clamp. So the pin rotates inside the crosshead but is fixed in the connecting rod. And then we thread the piston rod into the end of the crosshead. Piston goes on the end and then the nut retains the piston. And we're dangerously close to a reciprocating mechanism here. That's looking pretty good. Things are moving. So now I'll get the crosshead guides on there. Just tighten those down. We know those fit from before. And that's actually moving very well. So I'm pretty optimistic about this. All that work we did fitting up when we did the crosshead is paying off. Now let's cut to the chase. I promised you a run of this engine. You're going to get one. So I'm doing a very quick and dirty valve timing here. I'm going to cover lubrication and valve timing and all this other stuff for setting up an engine later, but let's just see a run here. There she goes. 
So this is running on about 4 PSI between 3 and 5 there. And I'm very happy with that. I think it's running really well. So there's still lots and lots of tuning to do on the valves. I did put the gland packing in, but not all the gaskets are in, so it is leaking in a few places still, but that's okay. For this quick and dirty setup, 4 PSI, I'm really, really happy with. So there's lots more to do on this engine yet though. So we're far from done just because it runs on air. Don't mean it's a steam engine. So thanks for sticking with me this far. I hope you enjoyed watching this part. If you like this series, maybe throw me a little love on Patreon and I will see you next time.